Nothing is more intriguing to a curious child than a locked door. What lies behind? What mysteries within? Secret gardens abound in literature and in legend around the world, fascinating children and adults alike. The history of the Chinese garden is that of a hidden treasure, a beauty behind the wall. Li Haifeng grew up listening to the legendary islands of Peng Lai, the mythical eastern abode of immortals. As an adult, he's turned these dreams into concrete by building his own dream garden in Shandong's Peng Lai city. Tous les jardins qui évoquent le paradis. En vérité, ce n'est pas un paradis, c'est des paradis. Mon monde, mon monde intérieur est un monde de rêve de légendes, d'histoires, de Chine, mais d'autres pays aussi. The Pajer Daiza in Belgium has the largest Chinese-style garden in Europe. As a little boy, its owner, Eric Dung, lapped up stories about China. Now in his 50s, he's finally made the sort of Chinese garden he read about into a reality. Eric is an admirer of Emperor Wu of the Han Dynasty. He's even named his Chinese garden Han Wu Di's Dream. Moi, je suis touché par l'histoire de cet empereur parce qu'il a, il symbolise. Uh, La destinée des hommes. On est petit, on grandit, on devient adulte, puis on, on vieillit. Euh, de lutter contre ça, de rêver, de, de créer un jardin et d'espérer qu'on va pouvoir changer les certitudes, c'est une belle histoire. Moi, j'aime les, j'aime les belles, les belles histoires. L'idée de, de vouloir devenir immortel en créant un jardin, c'est quand même. Plus sympathique. Two thousand years ago, in the time of Emperor Wu of Han, it was believed that the peaks of Quinlun in the west and Peng Lai in the eastern sea were the dwelling places of the immortals. There, those transcendent beings lived in beautiful gardens amid pavilions of jade and gold in a state of eternal bliss. China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, is supposed to have dispatched an expedition of 1,000 virgin boys and girls to find Peng Lai and to return, bringing him the secret of immortality. The expedition never returned. <laughs> Emperor 
Emperor Wu of Han wanted to outdo even the first emperor. He too sought the elixir of life and had the wonderlands of the Lake of the Supreme Essence and Imperial Forest Park constructed to this end. He hoped to be able to communicate with the immortals in the pavilions he'd built there. The islands on the lake were meant to symbolize Peng Lai. He even gave the name Peng Lai to one of his coastal cities. Thousands of years on, and most people have given up seeking physical immortality. But the immortal dream of building a paradise on Earth lives on. The plan of a lake with three peaks rising above it is classic of imperial Chinese gardens. In this form, the dreams of Emperor Wu of Han live on and thus too does his memory. La vie, c'est quoi C'est pas la réalité, c'est ce qui se passe entre la réalité et vous. Ce voyage de la réalité vers l'homme, grâce à son imagination, grâce à ses rêves et grâce à sa culture. Donc cette histoire, je l'adore. Et j'y crois. Elle me fait plaisir. The building of the garden bridges dreams and reality and forms other bridges too as Eric and his Chinese craftsmen become good friends. Two pandas from China have come to live in Pairi Daita's Chinese garden. More and more people have come to share in Eric's dream. If the Chinese garden in the West is part of an exotic fantasy, in the East, it's a refuge from the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Not that that makes it a shelter from all of life's problems. In the Song Dynasty, an army officer charged with delivering materials for the imperial gardens was made destitute when they went astray. As he walked the streets trying to sell his sword a local hoodlum picked a fight with him. The soldier slew the impudent miscreant. But now his plight was even worse, both destitute and an outlaw with a bounty for murder on his head. As the officer fled the capital to the Badlands, more ships, even those used to carry grain for the imperial granaries, were arriving to continue work on the emperor's garden. What was it about the exotic plants and rocks that commanded such importance in the eyes of society at the time? During the Northern Song Dynasty, Chinese landscape painting reached its peak of perfection. Emperor Huizong of the Song wanted to turn these pictures into reality at his Gernyue garden. For century after century, emperors had sought to construct a garden landscape equal to the myth of Peng Lai. It was more than just a garden. It was an expression of the emperor's spiritual and temporal hegemony. The Gunyue Garden marked a new peak in Chinese landscape design, a perfectly balanced environment of fastidiously arranged rocks and water. The rocks represent the mysterious Peng Lai here on Earth.
Five years after the completion of his garden, the now retired emperor saw his capital sacked by the Jurchen from Manchuria and his garden destroyed. The only rocks that survived, so-called relic rocks, were ones like those lost by that unfortunate officer that failed to make it into the emperor's fantasy garden. Later generations would comment that it was unbelievable that a dynasty should fall for its obsession with rocks. Artist Ye Feng creates installations presenting his own version of the Gen Yue Garden. Hong The one lake and three hills pattern laid down in Han Wudi's vision of Peng Lai has held through the centuries. Rocks and plants, water, peaks and pavilions make up basic models for the Chinese ideal of heaven on earth. However, it's a dream that all must somehow personalize to what they find in their own hearts. Orchid grower Zhao Yinquan and his wife take good care of their charges. When spring comes, these unprepossessing plants will sport the magnificent blooms for which they are renowned. According to later histories, Gou Jian, the fearsome warrior king of the state of Yue, planted an orchid on Zhu Mountain in the 5th century BCE. This is the earliest record of orchid growing in China. Over the following two and a half thousand years, orchids have spread from the mountains to imperial palaces and from ministers' gardens to ordinary family courtyards. Their changing For the Chinese, it's natural to want to align oneself with the ways of nature. A life lived in harmony with its rhythms is seen as the ideal.
These fine carp are musician Lin Gufang's companions. But he's lately found that his pool is too small for bigger fish and they can't swim freely. So he's arranged more comfortable accommodation for them at the restaurant of his friend, Lin Binghui. One day, the philosopher Zhuangzi and his companion Huizi were walking by a river. Zhuangzi saw the minnows darting to and fro and declared that the fish were happy in the water. Huizi asked him, you are not the fish, so how do you know that they're happy? Zhuangzi replied, you are not me, so how do you know that I don't understand a fish's happiness? The debate on solipsism aside, Zhuangzi is generally taken as the Taoist who best represents the ideals of living at one with nature, unencumbered by man-made vanities. In the late spring of 353, General Wang Xizhi invited some men of letters to the place where Gou Jian had planted his orchid. As they drank, the general was struck with a sudden melancholy. The transience of life overwhelmed him. Many before and since have felt the same. The garden is a solace to such questions of the soul. Its seasons and stages provide a comforting rhythm of life, death, and regeneration. A new beauty displayed at every turn. Nature becomes a balm for the anxious spirit. Chan 人毕竟是自然的一环，没有山林，这个终点的压力人是扛不起来。
The farther we are from nature, the stronger our wish to return. But who keeps us away from it? Reality or ourselves? Artist Yang Yongliang's work bridges the images of modern cities with ancient landscapes. Mountains and rivers always appear in his works, the very essence of Chinese people's love of their motherland. During the Wei and Jin dynasties, the third century AD, a group of free-thinking intellectuals, despairing of the tyranny and turmoil around them, chose to live in seclusion in the mountains. The Chinese utopia, like the Western one, is named after a famous literary work. In the Chinese case, it is the Tao Hua Yuan, the peach blossom spring. Spring meaning a water source or river head. The story describes a rural idyll, where people cut off from the outside world live in harmony with nature and with each other. Tao Yuan Ming's 4th century fable has remained a powerful, alluring fantasy ever since. So much so, that peach blossoms became another important theme in Chinese gardens. Around the pond, in the center of London's Victoria and Albert Museum, Chinese artist Xu Bing created one such magical landscape in miniature. The garden is the space in which all can realize their own peach blossom spring. Yomi These gardens combine the realms of the immortals with the human dream of the peach blossom spring. In 2013, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York staged its exhibition Chinese Gardens, Pavilions, Studios, Retreats. A critic in the New York Times described it as a paradise lost and found. 凝聚在大自然有时候不方便了，所以在花园之内就可以恢复这个大自然的环境，把这个花园当做一个凝聚的一个地区。On the second floor of the Met, the Astor Court is a Ming Dynasty-style courtyard. It was modeled on Suzhou's Garden of the Master of the Fishing Nets. A team of 26 Chinese craftsmen, led by Chen Songzhou, created it, the first of its kind outside of China. Well, 
您把这个走廊和名声放在一边了，把里面留空的，因为那在中国最宝贵的东西是什么呢？是空间，所以把这个空间保存下去，就让您的思想可以把它充满了。这个花园在纽约是一个非常宝贵的一个地方啊，在纽约这个人家都是很忙，呃，跑来跑去，反正这个环境之内能够安定下去，所以很多多人来的话，他们不单是观光，而是坐在这儿就休息，而且在博物馆看那么多文物，有一些自然光，有一些植物，呃，是换一个环境了。花园就是站在这个大自然和。城市文明社会的之间，是可以把这个人造的环境和大自然配合起来。Close by to the Metropolitan Museum is New York's famous Central Park, covering an area of over 800 acres. This public garden also provides a retreat from the frenetic pace of urban life. In the 1850s, its designers foresaw the problems of pollution and overcrowding in urban living, and came up with their solution to it: downtown Manhattan's very own Peach Blossom Spring. In the busy modern world, green spaces have never been more important. In the words of 17th-century English poet Andrew Marvel, the garden creates transcending these far other worlds and other seas, annihilating all that's made to a green thought in a green shade. In a Chinese garden, mountains and water symbolize both the universe and the body of the nation. Mountains and water are how landscapes are described in China. They evoke an immense emotional pull on the national psyche. People are just a small part of this greater tableau of life. The 24th day of the sixth lunar month is the birthday of the Lotus Goddess. Ye Feng invites some friends to his courtyard to celebrate the occasion.
The garden is a place in which to feast our senses. Sight, sound, touch, and by no means least, smell and taste. From satisfaction of the senses comes deeper contemplation. Xie Zhizhang is a tea expert from Taiwan. She's invited her friends to the Garden of Cultivation in Suzhou for a three-day tasting party. The Garden of Cultivation was built during the Ming Dynasty. It's still popular with the locals today. The money classes of late Ming could enjoy lives of extreme leisurely cultivation. Books on the subject like the Treatise on Superfluous Things by Wen Zhenhong became bestsellers. The Garden of Cultivation was owned by Wen Zhenhong's brother, Wen Zhenmeng. Its charms remain undiminished to this day. Life in the garden slows to the pace of nature. Nothing is rushed, nothing delayed. Everything takes place at its own proper pace. Ghe 一个生活空间里的不是走在博物馆里的The theme of the tea party is Sense of Autumn. Its leading role is taken by Oolong Tea from Taiwan. All enjoy the combination of autumnal scenery, the fragrance of tea, fruit and flowers. The garden can be a scene of gregarious exchange, as well as quiet contemplation. Xie Zhizhang's guests enjoy the tea, and the garden setting enhances their pleasure. It may all be but transient moments, 
but it is the quality found in that moment that makes a lasting effect. Ms. Xie believes one must be fully alert to it if one is to prevent it slipping through one's fingers. The garden isn't just a place on the earth, it's a place in one's heart and mind. The joys without are transfigured to a calm within. In the mid-18th century, scholar Shen Fu and his wife Yun Yang lived near the pavilion of surging waves, the oldest of the famous gardens of Suzhou. They didn't have a garden of their own, but still enjoyed visiting the pavilion. For Yun Yang, the ideal was to have a small courtyard where Shen could paint while she did needlework and grew vegetables. In living a simple life, the lovers enjoyed their time together, just like the immortals of Peng Lai. As the lotus flowers came into bud, Yun Yang would put tea in them overnight. The following day, she brewed the tea with fresh spring water. This became known as fragrant lotus tea. They were not rich. Later, when they could no longer visit the garden, they made their pleasure by growing lotus flowers in a bowl. For them, form didn't matter. It was spirit, not material riches, that gave meaning to life. Their story ends sadly with Yun Yang's early death. They never got to create their own garden, but Shen recorded their life together in his book, Six Chapters of a Floating Life. Tao 折射在那个井水里面，一词全部是那。庞喜 finds inspiration in Shen and Yun Yang's story. It captures the idea of a garden being a state of mind as much as any external form. 在做一个空间的时候，经常要跑一些园林去找一些相关的元素，然后再去做一些现代的改良，放到我的空间。Peng's studio combines industrial-style design, Suzhou garden rock features, and Japanese Zen garden influences. It's not a garden, but has some features of all of these. They have no visitors today. It's probably going to snow. Peng and his wife sip tea together in their cottage. With the tea ready and the flowers in bloom, they wait for the first snow. There is a garden in each person's heart. It will flourish as long as there is suitable soil.
孩子是往这个方向走，怎么走也是看着那么远。本来想开着飞机能不能能看看置身在海市蜃楼之中是什么感觉，啊，当时是一次来的童心，啊，这个这个有点可笑，<笑>看老头了呀，哎呀，走。<laughs> Lee likes to joke that even though he's not well educated, this doesn't stop him from seeking the wonderland of Peng Lai in his heart. The complex of the three immortal mountains has shrines dedicated to the founders of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism, and many different cultural relics are on display here. Many treasures fill this garden of the gods. Li Haifeng's Peng Lai Garden is worthy of an emperor's dream. It reflects a nation rediscovering the depths of its past riches and creating new treasures for future generations. <laughs> Seeing his works exhibited in a foreign country, artist Li Xiaochao suddenly remembers his grandma's backyard, a place he hasn't visited for years. 这个园林储物记忆应该是一种就是乡村的后院的一种感觉我们这一项最深的可能在我们的外婆家里它的后院特别大就像这里面就有好多花草当然现在看起来的东西和书本的一种多年生的一些草本植物那什么葡萄家
A new generation carefully shapes its own dreams of the gardens they will one day build. Behind those gates of enchantment lies the curiosity transformed to heart's ease. Wherever mankind has sought to go on our planet, he has sought to leave his mark. We live in a state of hope and expectation that is shaped by the magnificence of what we see around us. China's Great Wall protects the garden of the nation. Lesser walls protect the individual dreams within. But what comes from the soil must return to the soil. The miracle of a garden is its eternal power of regeneration. That is what makes a real, immortal wonderland.